with a bunch of siblings and you're all making up stuff and you're trying to be mediators for each other and you don't know what's true, hey, it's good news. The Lord is the Father to you. I'm going to coin him that phrase because Satan calls, uh, Jesus calls Satan the opposite. He calls him the father of lies. So we have God as the source of truth. Titus 1, 2 says God cannot lie. Nowhere in scripture can you find that God condones a lie. You'll find maybe a couple spots where someone lies and it seems to work out in favor, but you won't see God condoning a lie. He is the source of truth because he's purely holy and good. It's not that just, just that God knows the truth, but his truth is packed with goodness for his people. That is together. So what is true, every word that the Lord has spoken, every thought he has thought, he is thinking truth and truth alone. And that truth is only good and all good for his people. They don't separate. In fact, Jesus calls himself the truth, the truth, the way, the truth, the life in John 14, 6. So God loves the truth. And here's what God does with things he loves. God puts a plan in place to protect it and to keep it, right? He does that. And he does that for the promises he has, for his people who are a part of that promise. So here's what God does. And he says, I'm going to give you 10 laws. I'm going to start you out with 10 commandments, Exodus 20. I'm going to make two of these about protecting the truth. Remember we talked about one, the third commandment instructs us not to misuse the name of the Lord for false motives. Don't lie about the Lord, who the Lord is so we can get our way. So that protects love of the Lord, right? The second is the ninth commandment, which is now protecting our love for our neighbor. To not misuse the name of our neighbor or truth about our neighbor for our own false testimony or false gain. So, the Lord is protecting truth because he knows that truth itself protects and preserves. First of all, it's protecting God's glory because it's preserving our love for God. So, it's, it's really protecting our love for the Lord to know exactly who he is. And that preserves his glory. And it preserves his name in our worship. And we're here this morning because his name has been protected. Second of all, he is protecting our love for our neighbor, for our church, for our community, so that he can preserve the livelihood of people. Not just their livelihood, but their justice as well. So I don't know if there's ever been a time in your life where you knew some truth. Maybe someone gave you a good heads up. A good heads up is always good, right? Uh, but maybe you knew a truth that protected you. I'm not sure. If that's ever happened to you, I'll, I'll give you one example. Of Gina and I were coming back from a hike once, and so we're driving. You know how you go in Missouri, you go for a hike there, and you go through all these little small towns. Like, usually, I am a good planner, but I'm like, I don't need to plan this. All I want after a hike is our french fries. <laughs> I'll be honest. Just give me, like, a burger and fries. I'll even take McDonald's sometimes because... You know, after camping, you're like, just give me the fried stuff. Can't do that camping, right? I mean, some of you can. I've learned that recently. Y'all can cook anything out there. Um, but we're driving back, and we go by this place where, like, there's a fine line between, like, a place that looks like a gem and a place that is, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know what that place is. Yeah, about to kill you. Uh, so, a trap, pretty much. So we go to this place. I We forget the name. We're trying to think of what the name of this place was. I think it was like Aunt Mama's or something like some really weird name. We're like, hey, maybe that's maybe that's cool. It looks like a cool little cute place. Walk in there. I mean, there are no cars. Walk in. There's one person like sleeping on a counter. That's all. And we're like, we're committed. All right. We're here. We're hungry. They're, you know, they're, they're writing their menu on, on the wall, which sometimes that's a really good sign. Sometimes it's really, really not a good sign. My Grandpa Gary, though, here's the truth that I should have listened to. My Grandpa Gary told me, if there aren't cars in the parking lot, don't go there. <laughs> right? That is a good truth to abide by. And uh, we didn't. So we went in there, and, and it was just 
the, one of the worst meals we've had in our life. We both got fries. Gina got sweet potato fries. I got normal fries. They were raw. Oh. They were raw and they were just greased. It was just like, what is this? We didn't eat it. Don't. Well, maybe I ate a little bit. I mean, it's potatoes. Come on. But uh, anyways, I should have been protected by knowing the truth there. The truth has the power to protect us and maybe literally even save us. I don't know what that could turn into something a lot worse there. I just got to check Google reviews. But there's so much value in the truth. And God places so much value in the truth being told that he gives Moses extra law to protect him. Y'all remember Jethro? Best name in the Bible? No? Jethro was Moses' father-in-law. He had some advice for Moses. You remember what his advice was? Break it down. Yeah, did someone say break it down? Sounds like some dance advice. I don't know. But he said, yeah, pretty much. Uh, you, you got these big things, uh, big laws of, hey, is this right or wrong? Something's really obvious. Do I murder or not? Right? And this is before Ten Commandments, right? They're trying to figure out uh, is this right or is this wrong? Jethro tells Moses, you need to hire some folks, get some commanders, he calls them, out there, some truth commanders, and help them take the bigger laws, okay? Give them the big laws like, okay, did you murder that man's donkey or not, right? And if for the smaller things, take that to Moses, right? So he can discern with the Lord, with wisdom. Uh, he can talk to the Lord about this and say, is this right or wrong? Okay, so God, fast forward a little bit. When they receive the Ten Commandments, kind of acts like that. So the Ten Commandments, these are big laws. We're talking about them, and it's broken down into hundreds of smaller laws. But God helps them out a bit. He gives them some smaller laws because he knows people are going to be like, what about this? They're going to look at, do not swear or falsely against your neighbor, and they're going to think, okay, but what if I didn't start it? What if there's this false testimony just going around? And I just want to keep it going around. It's not like I started it like a kid, right? Just saying, I didn't start it. Well, look at chapter 23. Chapter 23 in Exodus. We're going to see from verses 1 to 9, we're going to see some, some smaller laws that are protecting this bigger law of telling the truth, not giving a false testimony about your neighbor. So let's start with that. Someone comes up to Moses and like, but what if I didn't start this false testimony? Well, look at verse 1. It says, you must not spread a false report. Do not join the wicked to be a malicious witness. But then they're like, oh, it's such a good rumor there. It's so much fun. Are you sure? It's like, Tell it in. You are sharing in this wickedness, this maliciousness. You are a witness if you are spreading a false report. Okay, Moses, but what if, what if most people believe that this rumor is true? What if we think it's true just because I've heard it from the majority of people? What do I do then? Well, verse 2, you must not follow a crowd in wrongdoing. Do not testify in a lawsuit and go along with a crowd to pervert justice. Moses, you're telling me that a lie is still a lie, even if the majority of folks believe it? Yes. He's saying, God is saying, just because the crowd believes it's a lie. He's saying even a jury can be all wicked. And therefore, this perverts justice. I think we get that. Sometimes it's harder to apply this truth, but I think we get it. It talks a lot about gossip and, and spreading false reports. But maybe someone's like, okay, but what if we're doing this for a greater good? What if we're coming together and we are making a strong case for a poor man who's in court and he just needs an extra push in life? He, he's, you know, he's wrong, but he needs an extra push. Let's get this guy out. Verse 3, do not show favoritism to a poor man, poor person in his lawsuit. So wow, God is pretty serious about the truth being true. 
So much so that even God's compassion, even compassion and enough of it, can't turn a lie into a truth. Think about that. Not even compassion, not even putting up a strong case for someone really needing the help, can turn a lie into a truth. The pastor, uh, Vodi Bakami, if you've ever heard of Vodi Bakami, he's a great pastor, author. He makes an interesting distinction. Now, I just want to give us a think about, it's not the sermon, it's part of it. He makes an interesting distinction between biblical injustice and social injustice. Social injustice, a lot of what we see, probably the, what the majority would say is what we need to fight for. Well, he says we need to stick to biblical injustice, and that is when there is an unlawful situation according to the law of God. That God's law is so clear, it is so clear cut that this is not right and that we should make things right. But in this case, truth telling, the truth is always protected. There's no deceiving a case into saying, okay, this is not God's law or not, like or this is wrong and turn that into a right. It is, we need to require just or grace and mercy if something's wrong, right? But he's saying, here's how social injustice is different. He says, this is when a case is inequitable. Now we talk a lot about equity and inequitable and, and it's all over the place, right? This is fairness is talking only about fairness, not just truth, but fairness. Life is very unfair, right? I think you would agree. But in this case, uh, that in verse four or verse three, in this case, this man's poverty would be more important than the truth that he was at fault for a crime. That he could be so poor or be, it could be so unfair for him in life that he would still, that that lie would be a truth, that he would, in the end, wouldn't be breaking God's law. Do you see a distinction there between biblical injustice and social injustice? Something more to think about, but God is prioritizing his truth because that truth is gonna set us free a lot more than trying to lie about what is right or wrong. All right, so let's play out this dialogue. What if... As if these people are seeing these laws, they're like, I'm really trying here to break this law and get away with it. What if it had, this false report doesn't have to do really with a human? Let's just say it's someone's uh, stray donkey or their ox it wanders. And let's just say it also belongs to my enemy. I mean, the guy doesn't like me. And let's say I just want to say it's mine. Shows up at my house. I'm going to say this donkey is mine. Well, man, first of all, you really want to break the law here, but verse four, look at verse four. If you come across your enemy's stray ox or donkey, you must return it to him. Okay, but what if they hate me, okay? What if, I mean, they really hate me, they want it out for me, and let's just say this donkey is helplessly dying. Like, come on, can I break, I mean, like, gosh, you're really trying here. You're really trying hard. Anyways, no, however, look at verse five. <laughs> if you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helplessly under its load, help, lying helpless under its load, and you want to refrain from helping it, you must help with it. Okay, what does this have to do with telling the truth? Well, sorry, even if you don't want it, now you have to help it, but why? It's not, it's not like he's lying about it being his anymore. Here's, here's why. Th because this isn't just about truth telling. The command to tell the truth is about justice. This is a topic on justice. It's more than just lying. So even if they are your enemy, the law is saying here that wrong is still wrong and it's still wrong to say that someone doesn't deserve justice. Even if they're your enemy, they hate you, and this donkey's like gonna die anyways. Justice is what needs to happen. I promise I won't go, I'll stop with the dialogue. But I want us to keep reading uh, these last few verses and, and notice, I think what we'll notice here, once you notice what you will, but notice this, when we get in the way of 
truth. What we're doing is we're getting in the way of God's justice. When we get in the way of God's truth, what is truth by suppressing it? We are getting in the way of God's justice. We can't get in the way of God on this. So let's keep reading verse six to nine and see how this thought all ties in to give in a false testimony or report against your neighbor. Verse six, you must not deny justice to a poor person among you in his lawsuit. So this is counteracting verse three. Okay, they're, they're poor. Yeah, they still did something wrong. Doesn't matter. They still do need a lawsuit as well. Like they still need to have justice, you know, fight for justice, right? There needs to be both. Verse seven, stay far away from a false accusation. Do not kill the innocent and the just because I will not justify the guilty. You must not take a bribe for a bribe blinds the clear sighted and corrupts the words of the righteous. And last verse, you must not oppress the resident alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be a resident alien because you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. So I think it's clear When we read these smaller laws, the Lord is saying that wrong is wrong. A lie is a lie. And I know we don't want to be so black and white on some things like this, especially when it comes to lying, and you know, we'll get to some of that. But the Lord is saying wrong is wrong. This is about justice. This is about the righteousness of God to have a fair chance to prevail, to not deceive and ruin that. Allow for God to have justice and not allow our sinfulness to get in the way and suppress that truth or alter that truth. I love American history, and maybe you do, Revolutionary War history. I just love it. Um, One of my favorite people, John Adams, just incredibly impressive. I feel like when you read his, his biography, but let me refresh your memory on an event that I thought uh, that really made me like John Adams. So back to history class, you remember the Boston Massacre, okay? That isn't just the Patriots defeating so many teams. That is actually in 1770 when the colonists in Boston, they get frustrated and they're it's just boiling over and they take it to the customs house and they're... They, There's a guy who gets hit by a British soldier. Next thing you know, there's this angry mob of hundreds of colonists. They're throwing rocks, they're throwing stones. And the British soldiers, there are eight more that come along and are eight there total. And they are trying to calm down the mob. And what happens but a gunshot goes off. And next thing you know, five of the colonists are killed. And this is one of the most critical events for really stirring up the revolution here. But John Adams, who at the time, very well-known lawyer, he's a revolutionary. He's known, you know, probably known for being that. He doesn't choose to represent the colonists, the people getting fired at by the guns, but he chose to represent the British soldiers. He said, I'm going to make sure that they have a fair trial. So cool, right? But what he's doing, he's putting his livelihood on the line. He's put his family, his kids, their livelihood on the line. Uh, It's ruining maybe his chances at future success with America and and the colonists. It really is uh, him seeking justice rather than being sinful or wanting to just look after himself. It's putting a lot on the line. So he chooses to defend them. And sure enough, two of the guys, they did get convicted for manslaughter, but six of them actually were proven not guilty. And so even while doing this, John Adams made sure that truth happened so that justice could happen. I just thought that, I mean, I I love that story. This truthfulness actually pays off 
leads to him being on the Massachusetts House of Reps, and then, as we know, he's the second president of the United States. Let me read what he, he wrote um, about this, because <laughs> he writes, it was, however, one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life. <laughs> so he's being honest that this was very, 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 very difficult to stand for the truth. He says, and one of the best pieces of service I have ever rendered my country. Judgment of death against those soldiers would have been as foul a stain upon this country. So even John Adams, I mean, John Adams had a godly perspective of the truth because he realized that truth belongs to God. We can't get in the way of it. We have to allow justice to belong to God. I think our problem when it comes to truth, I don't, if you're a big old liar, you got to work on that, y'all. But <laughs> preacher said you got to stop lying. No. Work on that, right? I think we get that. That's wrong. I think our biggest problem with the truth is that we get in the way of telling it, that we get in the way of truth. I think our problem with truth is that we either don't know how to say it or we don't say it at all. That's the harder part, right? That's the difficult part. Like, what do you do when you have to tell a friend something that you know will hurt them? It'll hurt their feelings. What do you do? Well, I don't know. Most of the time, I'm just going to avoid them. I'm just going to avoid bringing up the topic, right? But that is selfish. We are choosing to get in the way of something that would be good for them. Because if it's God's truth, it's good for them. We're getting in the way of something that's good for them. Well, what do we do when... Man, we know the Holy Spirit is nudging us to share the gospel truth about Jesus. But then we think, I didn't learn a way how to do this. I don't, I don't know how. What is my presentation like? I, I think I'm going to do a worse job. And with so many of those thoughts go through our head that we have self-justified ourselves of really just being a, a, too ashamed to share God's truth. We suppress it, we lie, and we kind of tell ourselves things like, I'm just going to be good enough so that they're going to believe that God is good. Well, in reality, you're not even good enough to care for their soul by sharing the truth with them. But what do you do also when you got to tell something to the pastor? You got to bring something to the church, and maybe this one's more personal. I got to bring it up. But, and there's a lot of times in, in ministry where, y'all, we need help. We need to know, hey, here's a blind spot. Can you, you know, tell me what usually happens is avoidance and next thing you know, someone isn't even in our church anymore. The truth is held back, it's suppressed, but the truth, if it's good, can be told in a good way with grace to actually make church better. God needs us to get out of the way of truth telling by not letting selfish motives derail us so God's justice can prevail. We have to allow God's truth and justice to prevail. And I'm sure as I've talked about truth telling, you're thinking things like, okay, what about white lies? You know, what if someone just, they don't look good in that dress, but, you know, I just got to tell them. And, you know, you know, there are so many of those, right? What about white lies? Let's get more serious. What if something's actually going to hurt someone's feelings and, just really hurt them emotionally? What if something can actually, what if the truth can actually hurt someone physically? I mean, let me just bring up the, probably the scariest scenario we might ever be in. What if you are, how, you're in the, in the Holocaust, you're like Corey Tenboom, you are housing Jews in your house, you are hiding a Nazi soldier comes up and asks, are you housing anyone in here? What do you do? Gosh, you feel the weight of that? I'll give you another example. What if you're a Christian in a country where it is illegal to profess your faith in Christ and they come into your house and they ask you on behalf of your whole family, do you believe in Jesus? If not, we will kill you and your whole family. I'm not making that up. That's happening probably at this moment or on this day in a country in the world. What do we do? Now, it's very difficult to say the situation's gonna happen to us. And I, 
hypothetically, I think these things all the time. And because I read these stories about martyrs and I read that they actually, they profess truth in Christ. They, they value, they trust blind faith, right? That by sharing the truth of Jesus, they will be better off even if they are dead for doing so. So it's tough to put ourselves in this situation, but as a pastor up here and the Bible in my hand, I cannot tell you a moment in scripture where the Lord condones a lie. Now, I do believe there's a lot to learn from the Lord about how to seek him for discernment and for wisdom on how to use our words, but I can't give a case for a lie creating a righteous situation. Lying in the Bible is simply a sin. It takes a lot of faith to do that. Like every other commandment, telling the truth takes faith. And if we love Jesus first and foremost, we will keep his commandments. Because here's the issue with all these questions, white lies, lies of hurting feelings, hurting like actual lives. And most of these circumstances, what we are trying to convince ourselves is a lie. And that lie is that we can lie out of love for our neighbor. That we can lie out of love. In other words, that we can go outside the righteousness of God to create a righteous result for God. In other words, that we can love our neighbor more than loving God. Just a short time. As if it is gonna come back around. That's what we do every time we lie, anytime we sin and expect a righteous result. But God says, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So I'm gonna leave that at that. But I wanna give us, to wrap things up, I wanna give us some actual tangible things. If we are to be faithful as truth tellers as the church, because John says that we are co-workers in the truth as a church. We are co-workers in the truth the truth. I want to give us some ways that Jesus is, God is trying to preserve our, our, the church as the light. He's trying to keep salt, saltiness, right? He's trying to keep us for the world, a light to the world. Here's the first one. The first one, and there are several of these if you want to write them down and put it in your notes or so. The first one is we need to make a decision as Christ followers to not ruin our witness by lying. To not ruin our witness by lying. Telling even a white lie. Y'all know those folks. They're gonna tell you a white lie. You go to them, you know. You, you can test them a little bit, right? They're afraid of your feelings. They're afraid of, you know, not being liked. You know, we're all kind of like that. But what they're doing, even you know, as Christ followers, what we're doing is we are lessening our witness, even a white lie is turning us more into a tr untrustworthy reputation. And the lie is going to do that. What, what, is it, what is a hard thing to gain back? Truth or trustworthiness is a hard thing to gain back. So we, most of all, are mouthpieces and messengers and ambassadors of the gospel truth, the gospel message. Our whole life should be preserving our ability to give that message out. Listen, if, if you're telling me all day long, I look good in these shoes and they match, and you're wrong and I know it, I, I, you know, I, what you say about Jesus is gonna be, you know, is, I'm not gonna believe you as much, but they're more serious things. If I can't trust you as a tr trustworthy person and I, I don't know who Jesus is, listen, it's gonna be hard for me to just say, oh, I don't trust everything else you say, but I trust what you say about Jesus. That's our witness of what we claim Jesus to be. So do not ruin your witness by lying. We have to not lie. The second thing is to not gossip. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Proverbs 6, 28 says, a contrary person spreads conflict and gossip separates close friends. And I say that and you're like, yep, I know how that feels, right? But gossip, we get it. But how you talk, I've learned this in life. How you talk about other people in front of me is how you talk to other people about me, Right? right? So I'm bad at it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit, I'm, I can be really bad at this too, but 
that is a dead giveaway on how people, their true character is. How do they talk about other people in front of you? Let's just choose not to gossip and hold each other accountable to it. The third thing, and we see this in these, these smaller laws, to not show favoritism, to not show favoritism. And James says it, it's, you know, and it's in the gospel, like God does not show favoritism. But James 2.9 says flat out, however, if you show favoritism, you commit sin. Never, I mean, rarely we get that like, okay, this is sin, favoritism, sin, right? Because if God can't show favoritism, why can't his people? But everyone is made in the image of God and deserve to be, to, have, to know the truth and deserve to know the grace and the mercy of Christ. So let's choose not to show favoritism. Fourth one, to not seek vengeance with our mouths. So many times we think, oh, you know, maybe I can just put a lie in there. Or maybe I can just put an attitude in there or a mood in there and they'll kind of paint the picture of like, stay away from that person, don't like that person and it spreads and that bitterness just spreads, right? Let's choose not to do that. Because again, we are taking over God's judgment seat and we are getting in the way of his justice when we do that. Rather, Scripture calls us to love even our enemies. That's Jesus. Love your enemies. And then Ephesians 4 says we need to build each other up with graceful truth. It says no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good, only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. That doesn't mean that something good is going to be a lie. It can't be good if it is a lie. But that good that builds up someone in need is truth. Let's follow that. Second to last, do not suppress the truth. Do not suppress the truth. God will have his judgment on those who suppress the truth. And when he talks about this, he talks about in this way of when the Holy Spirit is telling us something is true and we suppress it. We believe the Holy Spirit is right and we purposely choose to live apart from it. We purposely decide that we have a better truth. But this also applies to how we love our neighbor because when the Holy Spirit says this is true and you need to get, deliver that truth and we suppress that truth, we are at fault for not sharing truth with our neighbor and sharing the gospel. Don't suppress the truth. It is still a sin. Now on the other side of it, the last thing, there's something we need to do. Something we need to do is we need to seek God's wisdom and discernment for our words. I've said that uh, before, but that is also part of this faith thing. The faith thing isn't, hey, I'm not gonna lie anymore, but faith brings you to God to know and ask, how do I have this hard conversation? How do I handle this moment? How do, how do I tell the truth? I know this person needs to hear your hope. How do I do that? Go to God, seek wisdom and discernment. Otherwise, it is not for us to just act like we got truth serum and we're blabbering about the truth and we're telling everyone how their outfit looks like. You know, we don't want that going on, right? But we have to be, walk with the Spirit in how we deliver truth. A sermon for another time is about casting our pearls before swine. We have discernment through the Holy Spirit. We need to use that too. So take these, I mean, these are decisions I think we need to make to be truth tellers because we're preserving our witness, we're preserving the justice of God. We are going to be seen as a, a church in our city that is a light that isn't gonna just tell people what they wanna hear, but tell people what they need to hear, that Jesus is the truth and the way and the life, no matter what the consequences may be for us. So uh, I, I want... Um, we can move to communion. I want to, because I want to give you all this thought. I want to bring it to Jesus. I, I told you there was a second thing that was really interesting about this, this story. And during this trial, and if you're in John 18, you're going to see that John, who, who was with Jesus and Mary, I mean, at, at, at the cross, he was there. There was a man who wasn't there one of Jesus' 
closest disciples, the man who had his name changed to The Rock, Peter The Rock Johnson, um, because he is going to uh, help lead and build God's church. And John documents during, like in between this trial period, that even Peter, who is the rock, right? <laughs> or he's not the rock, but yeah, Jesus is the rock. But he, even Peter, who's chosen to build the church, is spreading falsehood about Jesus. He records, Jew, I mean, he's telling people that he does not have any association with Christ. So I think that we have to remember that so much, because as the church, as co-workers in the truth, we have all, like every single one of these commandments in a way, have broken that commandment. And if we truly want justice as a church, if we truly want justice, we should kind of be afraid of that, because justice for lawbreakers of Christ means that we don't get to have the promise of life with Christ, that the law and sin separates us from God. We too have broken this law. We too, like Jewish officials, have put Jesus up on the cross with our sin. The verdict is out and the justice is not in our favor. And we cannot earn our way by doing good things to get that back in our favor. But the gospel message of this is this, that even though we fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, that Jesus decided to take on the most unjust act in history so that we could have justification, so we could have justice we don't deserve, so that we could be forgiven and we could be made just right as he wants us to, as one of his own still. We are in this room as law breakers. So, we can be the Jewish officials, and we can hear that, hey, we are guilty, we are at fault for breaking the law, and, and many other things, but listen, we could also be like Peter, Peter who is guilty as well, but the big difference between them is Peter has a heart of repentance. Peter knows he broke the law. Peter knows he's guilty. Peter knows that he isn't just going to earn his way back into it. But Peter knows, and he is repented by only the blood of Jesus will he be able to be made right again. But a lot of us think there's a third option by being Pilate too. A lot of us think, I don't go to church. You know, I'm just hearing about this. You know, I'm, not one, I, I'm, I'm away from this. You know, I'm just a Roman governor I'm not choosing a side in this, but the blood is on Pilate's hand as well. By believing that we don't know better, it's, it's not true. But the truth is for all of us, we either respond by rejecting Christ or following him with a repentant heart. That heart that turns to him and still knows he is true no matter how wrong we are. So as we pass communion I want us to think about that injustice. I want us to think about that bread that was the body of Christ that was broken for us, though we didn't deserve it. I want us to think about how the juice was the blood of Christ that was spilled for us because we, in part, have all been accused of spilling that as well. But I want to give us this last verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I want to pray for us as truth tellers, uh, what the Lord is, is doing in our hearts and also for our response. If, if you are aware of how righteous the Lord is, how good the Lord is, and you are aware of this chasm between us as being guilty of believing lies, living lies. And if you've never followed Christ or made a decision to follow Christ, I would love to talk about that. Talk to a pastor, 
um, elder here. Let's talk about it. If you are in a place where you are a believer and you are repentant, let's go to God and continue with a genuine heart to be made right, right by him alone. That is the justice that the Lord wants for us. Let me pray, and then I keep saying we're going to pass out communion, but it's up here. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll take communion together. Lord, I thank you for your truth. Lord, this truth has set this room free. Lord, we were enslaved by lies, and, and that's what it all comes down to, a lie that we can live apart from you and be good, a lie that we can go around you and do the wrong things to, to earn you to us. Lord, what a lie. But the truth is that, Lord, you needed to be here. You needed to, your body needed to be broken and poured out for us. You needed to be our sacrifice to bring us to reconciliation. Lord, and we thank you humbly for that. We are grateful for doing what we could not do, Lord, for, for going through with this unjust act. Lord, for being our Savior and our Lord. And so we take this moment together as a church to remember it. And Lord, we pray for your spirit to continue to lead us into better truth telling. Lord, so the whole world can know the hope you have and we can be a trustworthy witness of your gospel truth and grace and mercy. Lord, we thank you for this time together. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So there are two spots up here. You can come up and, and take communion. There's also offering box as well, or if you have a connect card uh, to put in there too. Sing whenever you're ready this morning.
be seated. We've got just a few announcements this morning before we head out. Hey, everybody. So a um, couple things coming up uh, tonight, Trunk or Treat, which will be inside. <laughs> um, trunkless. Trunkless treating. So we will figure that out when you guys come. So hopefully you can uh, pivot from that. But um, yeah, that's going to be tonight. So well, the goal will be that everyone will be ready to go at 5. Um, so if you have a little bit of time to prepare, you don't show up at 5, be here before 5, so you're ready to go by 5. Um, so looking forward to that. So um, who all is planning to come? Woohoo! That's right, that's right, good. Um, next, next weekend, uh, which is uh, Saturday, November 4th, we have, and there's a QR code up there, so ladies, get your phones out. Um, we have tr uh, our women's breakfast. And so we have two fantastic speakers. We have Brooke, who will be giving us a testimony. Very excited for that. And then also Michelle will be giving us um, her, she'll be uh, speaking with us as well. A um, Couple things about that, we're changing things around a little bit. So one thing in particular for women's ministry, kind of the vision for that is really wanna see what's important to us. How, what ministries can we speak into as the, the women of the church? Um, Turns out that we're in November. That's when Thanksgiving is, right? So we're going to be doing something to link with the food pantry. Um, we've got Marty's going to be helping us get some uh, turkeys. So thank you, Marty, for that. And then also looking for things maybe Thanksgiving-y, maybe some stuffing, some cranberries. If you can bring some things to add to the food pantry, um, it's that time of year where people who don't have a lot, you know, uh, this would be a great blessing for them. So. Um, so that's, again, uh, next Saturday, uh, 9 to 11, all women are, are welcome. And then, again, QR code to sign up for the potluck. Um, and then uh, the following week, which will be um, is that the 9th, I believe, um, no, 10th, 10th at 6.30, we're going to be doing a covenant members meeting. So uh, that Sunday at 6.30. Oh, sorry, the 5th, sorry. Bar. Is it up there? Yes, that's what that says. The 5th at 6.30, covenant members meeting. Um, any questions or concerns on that, talk to Sean or Jason, or if you're an elder, raise your hand. So you might even be sitting next to an elder. You don't know. Um, but that'll be about that, so next Sunday. So um, thank you, guys. Um, and just want to say, um, you know, maybe bow our heads and pray out. Um, so Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the sermon we had today that talked about um, the way that we uh, speak and uh, how that influences others and our neighbors. Um, it's one of those big commandments that we're called to follow. And I think it's really important as we walk through the days, through the week, we think about um, the way we speak um, about others and how that interacts with them. We pray that um, you help us bite our tongue when needed and maybe speak out when it's needed as well. Um, because we are a reflection of Christ in all that we do. And, um, you know, he is... God above all things, and we just ask that he, um, that we reflect him well in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to keep you a few more minutes here. Um, with our church in the five years we've been together, um, we've kind of set up a pattern in October to do uh, something for our pastors for appreciation. So if uh, Sean and Ryan and Jason, you're here already, so that's easy. Um, if you wouldn't mind to come up here. Um, these guys have been um, working for and with the church since before it existed, really. Um, and they continue to kind of carry the duties and um, uh, making everything work from one week to the next. Uh, one trait that they all share is a servant's heart. Um, if there's anything that you need, need done or need help with, they can either do it themselves or they can point you in the right direction. So that's been a huge blessing for our church. Um, so with with this, we've taken up a kind of a special offering for the past couple of weeks. We can do that today. If you go onto the online giving portal, there is a drop down for pastor appreciation. So um, you're still able to do that. But uh, it's just a way to uh, give a little extra for these guys that just dedicate so much time and effort to the daily duties of our church. So uh, if you wouldn't mind to pray with me one more time for the guys. 
and maybe extend out a hand. Dear Heavenly Father, just uh, thank you for these men and uh, putting them here with our church to, uh, to carry out your will for this world. Um, Lord, I just pray that you continue to keep that fire going to serve you well and to uh, protect their hearts from whatever might be out there to distract them. Lord, just thank you so much for all they do for us. In your holy name, amen. That's it. I think we're done. So just in case you didn't notice, there should have been a direct deposit for each of you guys that came in Friday.